There we go. All right, we're recording. Uh, so like I mentioned, we're, this week we're going to cover uh, Lecture 3, which is uh, Notable Figures in Wildlife Management. So it'll be a little bit of history again. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the people in a little more details on some of the people. Uh, when we're done today, I do have an assignment that you're going to take with you to do for the for next week. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. There we are. Notable figures in wildlife management. I'm going to cut the light so we can see better. All right. And we're going to kind of go in chronological order as best as we can, at least in chronological order here. Uh, and so we'll start with the in the 1800 or sorry, 1700s, mid 1700s to early 1800s. Uh, we have William Bartram, who was known as our first native born naturalist and artist. So this was the first American born naturalist. Uh, at least that, that's what he's known as. Uh, he was the first author who portrayed nature through personal experience as well as scientific observation. Uh, we call him the grand old man of American natural science. Uh, he advised and mentored the first generation, generation of naturalists uh, who are beginning to explore the new territories of America and uh, all those territories being added to the new young nation. So beginning in 1773, he began a four-year journey traveling through the eight southern states, recording information on flora and fauna, as well as Native Americans. So he was just traveling around the southeast, uh, writing down everything he saw, uh, taking notes on what the Native Americans were doing, on what animals were doing, on, on plants that he found, uh, all kinds of stuff. In 1791, he com completed his book, best known today as Bartram's Travels, or just Travels. Uh, it's still considered one of the foremost sources of information on pre-settlement conditions of the South. So this is where, when we talk about when colonial settlers arrived here and they saw the entire Southeast was basically on fire from the Native Americans doing controlled burning, uh, Bartram was the one that made those observations. He was one of the first ones to go to these places and, and write down what he saw. Uh, after his adventure in the south he settled in pennsylvania and helped his brother uh in the in a botanical gardens there uh but this was important this is an important step in any natural history is just writing down what's there what's going on um and this is a lot of, again a lot of our information about just what was happening pre-colonial times a lot of that comes from bartram and other notes from other people who were just you know writing things down Then we have Alexander Wilson. He's, he was alive around the same time, a little bit younger, but uh, pretty pretty close time period. He was born in Scotland, and then he came to the United States in 1794. He lived down the street from William Bartram, and he opened Bartram's Botanical Garden in Pennsylvania. Uh, Bartram served as Wilson's mentor. He directed him in ornithology, and opened uh, and opened several libraries to the younger to 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 Wilson. <clears throat> Wilson already had a taste for nature and specifically ornithology. He carried his <clears throat> interest in the natural world front with him from Scotland. Uh, in particular, we we have a lot of um, ornithological things named after Alexander Wilson. So there's the Wilson's Ornith Ornith Ornithological Society, Wilson's Warbler. Um, there's several bird things that uh, are named after Alexander Wilson. He's done a lot of things. In 1803, he wrote uh, he wrote to a friend from Scotland to say, "I am now uh, I'm now about to make a collection of our finest birds." So he was starting to <clears throat> taxidermy birds. Uh, two years later, he sent 28 drawings uh, to William Bartram to see uh, what Bartram thought of them if they were. Good drawings, were they accurate? 
Could they be used as uh, uh, plates to identify birds with? He took uh, long strolls through the American countryside. Usually he'd be alone. Uh, it became characteristic of Wilson in the next, uh, in several few years, he was just always found walking around the countryside. <clears throat> Uh, this is where he got most of the information for his uh, his nine volume work uh, named Ornithology. So he literally wrote the book on ornithology. Uh, his goal was to publish a book illustrating all the birds in North America. <clears throat> uh, with this in mind, he traveled widely, watching and painting birds and collecting uh, subscribers for his book. The result was a nine-volume American, uh, American ornithology from 1808 to 1814. And he illustrated 268 species of birds, 26 of which had never been previously described by science. He died, unfortunately, during the writing of his ninth volume, which was completed and published after his death by his friend George Ord. And he's now regarded as the greatest American ornithologist prior to Audubon. In fact, it's debatable which one is greater, Audubon or Wilson. Uh, it was his meeting with Audubon in Louisville, Kentucky in 1810, which probably inspired the younger man to produce a book of his own illustrations. Uh, in other words, Wilson likely inspired Audubon's drawings and paintings. Which brings us to Audubon, 1785 to 1851. <clears throat> uh, for almost half a century, he was this young country's dominant wildlife artist. In other words, he was going around drawing all kinds of animals, particularly birds, uh, but he would draw lots of things, not just birds, but also plants and animals. Uh, but he is most well known for his bird, his bird drawings and paintings. His seminal work, The Birds of America, uh, is a collection of 435 life-size prints they qu that quickly eclipsed Wilson's work, which did not have anywhere near that many species in it. And is still the standard in which 20th and 21st century bird artists, such as uh, Roger Troy Peterson or David Sibley, are measured. So his art still is relevant today, and it stands up to contemporary artists like David Sibley, who's around drawing right now, making art right now. <clears throat> He came from France to the United States, and uh, he lived on a family-owned estate in Mill Grove near P Philadelphia. Uh, there he hunted, studied, and drew birds, and met his wife Lucy, Lucy Bakewell Audubon. Uh, there in Pennsylvania, he conducted the first known bird banding experiment in North America. He started tying strings around the legs of eastern Phoebes. He learned which birds returned to the very same nesting sites each year just by doing that, just by using bands on their legs, which is a common practice that we use today, banding birds. He also learned that the nature of the place, whether high or low, moist or dry, sloping north or south, or bearing tall trees or low shrubs, generally gives a hint as to its inhabitants. In other words, habitat dictates what animals are present. Animals are only present in certain habitats. And if you can learn those associations, a lot of times you narrow down your, your list of animals that you, know, you might be possibly looking at. It's really helpful when you're dealing with birds. There's so many birds. Uh, he was an early explorer and naturalist here in the United States. He set off on epic quests through the Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida uh, to depict America's avifauna, so all the birds of, of America. He had nothing but his gun, artist materials, and a young assistant. Uh, and it says young assistant, but that was actually a slave. So let's keep that in mind. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, he floated down the Mississippi River, living rugged, hand-to-mouth existence in the South, while Lucy, his wife, was earning money as a tutor for wealthy fam plantation families all around the Southeast while he was working. He was an avid hunter and also had a deep appreciation uh, and concern for conservation. He, The way he drew his birds, the way he got his specimens for art is he would shoot the bird and then he would pose it and then he would draw it. That's how all his drawings came to be. Every single drawing 
that Audubon ever made or artwork that Audubon ever made. He shot a bird, he taxidermied it, posed it, and then and then drew it or painted it or whatever. That's how he got his painting. It's not wasn't as big of a deal at that time. There were not dwindling wildlife populations. We weren't worried about, oh gosh, you shot a heron and the plume trade is going on, so we're gonna we're losing all our herons. That wasn't happening yet. Uh, not quite yet, but he was uh Quickly, we started learning that we were losing birds to people shooting them uh, for for plumes and things like that. We'll talk about what what's going on with the plume trade, but Audubon was shooting birds to draw them and didn't seem to affect populations doing that. Uh, after traveling to Eng England to raise money for his book, he published that book, Birds of America, which consisted of 435 life-sized hand-colored prints of almost 500 species of birds. His later uh, writing sounded the alarms about the destructions of birds and their habitats. He was a slave owner and has faced recent criticism over his part in the institution, which he did willingly take part in and vehemently defended. He was very anti-abolitionist. He was very much pro-slavery. He had several slaves and enjoyed having slaves and was, he and his wife frequently, um, campaigned for slavery against against abolitionists uh, and anyway if you're wondering anything about that you'd like to learn more about audubon's part in slavery how much did he really contribute did he really care should we throw out all of audubon's work because he was a slave owner um, well there's lots of news about this there's lots of articles about it including from the audubon society themselves they're the ones that came out and said, hey, yes, he was indeed a slave owner. He did indeed was pro-slavery. Um, and they uh, denounced that. Uh, so it's important to remember that we can celebrate a person's contributions that they've made to the world without celebrating the flaws of a person. Um, it's okay to say he was an awful person who took part in slavery willingly and enjoyed enjoyed, seemed to enjoy slavery. Uh, but also acknowledge that his art and science inspired millions of people to learn about birds and care about nature. So we don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we can acknowledge that he probably wasn't the best best guy in the world. Role model in his personal life, maybe not something you should take. But his scientific literature, his work as a scientist were all excellent. That brings us to George Bird Grinnell. So 1849 to 1938. So we're getting into the 1900s. Uh, he's aptly named. He's, his middle name is Bird. Uh, and he is uh, he is well known for being a, a birder. Uh, he developed an early and abiding love for birds. He attended school at John James Audubon's mansion in New York, which was near their, the Grinnell family home. Uh, and he and his siblings knew the Audubon family well and freely roamed their estate. He even played in the bards that uh, housed a huge collection of bird skins and specimens that Audubon was using for his artwork. He studied at Yale with an intense desire to be a naturalist and participated as a naturalist on various expeditions. Uh, he was well known for his ability to get along with Indian elder or Native American elders. His writings are considered top notch in the field of anthropology, and he studied Native American life. He served as an advocate for Native Americans for his entire life. He eventually became the editor of Forest and Stream Magazine, which eventually became Field and Stream Magazine. Uh, at that time, it was the leading natural history magazine in North America. It is still uh, a well-known natural history magazine, Field and Stream. Uh, he was also a founder of the Audubon Society and the Boone and Crockett Club. Uh, so Grinnell was one, only one of the founders of the Audubon Society, along with John James Audubon's wife, Lucy. Uh, and they founded that society in the 1800s. He was tutored, tutored by Lucy Audubon, which at the time was was John James's widow. Uh, he know, knowing Audubon's reputation, he chose his name 
as the inspiration for the organizer's earliest work to protect birds in their habitats. He named it the Audubon Society. Today, the name Audubon remains synonymous with birds and bird conservation the world over. So again, we can celebrate the man's achievements, but not celebrate the man himself. That's an important thing we need to learn about history in this country. Next up, George Perkins Marsh. So we're a little bit earlier, 1801 to 1882. So we've gone back a couple of years, uh, but we're still in a general time frame of the 1800s, late eight, oh, to late 1800s, and even early 1900s for George Bird Grinnell, but the others are all 1800s so far. Uh, so George Perkins Marsh was considered to be America's first environmentalist. So learn these titles because they come up on quizzes and questions all over the place. William Bartram, America's first native-born naturalist. George Perkins Marsh, America's first environmentalist. Mm -hmm. He was known as the father of the environmental movement. In 1864, Marsh finished the book Man and Nature, uh, which was an ecological work where Marsh argued that deforestation can lead to desertification. So in other words, cutting down all the trees and continuing to cut all the trees can lead to the desert eventually. He picked up this idea when he saw damage that Vermont farmers were doing by clearing their land. Uh, at first, he wanted to use a more radical title called Man, the Disturber of Nature's Harmonies. Uh, but his publisher thought he should um, take a little bit of the sting out of that title. So he had a revised edition that he published in 1874, and he changed the title to The Earth as Modified by Human Actions, Man, and Nature. And eventually that title got shortened down even further to just Man and Nature. Uh, this was the first modern discussion of our ecological problems. This was the first person to look around and say, hey, maybe we are actually affecting the environment here. Maybe we are actually cutting too many trees. Maybe it's possible to actually cause deforestation here in North America. Maybe we can take too much game. He was the first one to really start pointing that out. Uh, he had a, a saying, he said, we are not passive inhabitants of the earth. We give the earth its shape and form. We are responsible for the earth. No other animal can affect the earth like we can. Therefore, we are responsible for it. The oper This is another quote. The operation of causes set in action by man has brought the face of the earth to a desolate to desolation almost as complete as that of the moon. So he was looking around at all this desolation that was going on and thinking, gosh, we can't sustain this. Uh, we'll move on to Henry David Thoreau. So here we got another title, The Father of Environmentalism. So the father of environmentalists, or first environment, for America's first environmentalist, the father of environmentalism. Uh, get those straight in your brain. Uh, Thoreau went to Harvard. He graduated from Harvard. He was a writer. He could describe at length the sound of a loon's call, the vastness of a forest, or the way a berry hangs off a bush. Uh, and one of his famous quotes was, in, will, in wildness is the preservation of the world. He was one of the first uh, to argue for uh, in favor of national forest. He wrote the books Civil Disobedience and Walden, Walden which are his two best uh, well-known books uh, and was just an overall uh, incredible writer about nature and natural things. Uh, particularly Walden's a really good book if you're interested in nature writing. John Muir, also a writer and a naturalist and an environmentalist and just about everything. Uh, 1838 to 1914. He is the father of the national parks. He's also known as the wilderness prophet. And yes, I can ask you these titles on a quiz or a test. Uh, his words and deeds help inspire President Theodore Roosevelt's in innovative conservation programs. We're going to talk a little bit about Roosevelt here in a minute. Uh, that, including, that included establishing the first national monuments by presidential procl proclamation 
and also establishing Yosemite National Park by Congressional Act. In 1892, John Muir and other supporters formed the Sierra Club to make the mountains grand, or make the mountains glad, excuse me. Uh, and he was the club's first president. And he has a lot of quotes attributed to him. Uh, here's one. If you think about all the gains that our society has made from independence to now, it wasn't government. It was activism. People think, oh, Teddy Roosevelt established Yosemite National Park. What a great president. B.S. It was John Muir who invented, who invited Roosevelt out and then convinced him to ditch his security and go camping as it was Muir, an activist, and a single person. That's from, uh, I don't, I'm not familiar with it. Yvonne Charinard, Chalinard, man, I just butchered who, that name, but um, that's a really good quote because that is true. Uh, Muir took Theodore Roosevelt out into the wilderness of Yosemite Valley and they walked around and they escaped the president's security detail or they just kind of walked away from him and left him. And they went and got lost in the woods. And while they were lost in the woods, Muir was telling Roosevelt about all all the nature, all the things they were seeing and why it was important. Uh, and that really shaped a lot of what Theodore Roosevelt did in the next several years. John Muir was what we call a preservationist. Preservationists believe in the complete protection of natural resources. Man, natural resources. And we'll talk about how that differs from conservationists here in a minute when we get to Gifford, Gifford Pinchot. But it is important that you know that John Muir was a preservationist. He believed in the complete protection of natural resources. He was born in Scotland. His family immigrated to the United States and settled in Wisconsin. Uh, for his first botany lesson, a fellow in his first botany lesson as a student, a fellow student plucked a flower from a tree and used it to explain how the grand locust is a member of the pea family related to straggle to the straggling pea plant. This fine, this is a quote from, from Muir himself. This fine lesson charmed me and sent me flying to the woods and meadows with wild enthusiasm. Uh, so he planned to continue on to South America, but he was stricken by malaria and wound up in California instead. And when, while in California, he headed to a place you may have read about or a place he had read about called Yosemite. Uh, he was a sheep herder and rancher in the, in the Yosemite area. And then he held various other positions and odd jobs. He did a lot of, uh, he was kind of a handyman. He just kind of went around fixing people's property, fixing fences, fixing houses, whatever people needed, uh, Muir would go do it. He was really good friends with uh, Gifford Pinchot and Theodore Roosevelt. He was the founder and first president of the Sierra Club, and he helped establish Yosemite Valley, Valley as America or as a national park. He's got a lot of really good quotes. Uh, things like, when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it attached to the rest of the world. Talking about how ecosystems are connected. Uh, also, everybody needs beauty as well as bread. Places to play in and pray in where nature may heal and give strength to the body and soul. He also said some famous things that you see misquoted quite frequently on t-shirts and hats. Uh, things like, in every walk in, with nature, one receives far more than he seeks. Uh, you'll, also, you'll, you'll see this on all kinds of stuff misquoted. The mountains are calling and I must go. I always see the forest is calling and I must go, or the trees are calling and I must go. They're always on t-shirts or those, you know, boards that everybody loves to put in their house that have a saying on them. Um, there's a ton of those that have this quote on it, but it's usually misquoted as the, the forest is calling or something. Um, some part of it's been changed, but this John Muir is the one that said it. The mountains are calling and I must go. He also said, keep close to nature's heart and Blake, Break clear away once in a while and climb a mountain or spend a week in the woods. Wash your spirit clean. He was a firm believer that uh, just being in nature could, could soothe the human soul. And let's talk a little bit about his friend, uh, Gifford Pinchot, who graduated from Yale and then went to France to study forest. 
forestry, excuse me. Since there was no forestry here in the United States at the time, that's where he had to go to study forestry. When he returned to the U.S., he used his ties with President Roosevelt to influence policy and was an active in educating young foresters. He brought forestry back here to America, and uh, and we'll talk about Carl Alwyn Shank as well. And so along with Shank, they both taught America what forestry was supposed to be. Pinchot was a conservationist. Conservationists believe in the wise use of natural resources. And it's important here, there's a note here in red, that you keep track between the differences between conservation and preservation. So conservation is natural resources management through wise use. This is the philosophy of the Forest Service, the, natural, the National Forest System. So Cherokee National Forest, Bisga National Forest, things like that. These are areas that we use. They are conservation areas. The National Park System is preservation, is set up in the vision of John Muir. Preservation means we don't do anything to it. We leave it. We walk away from it. We don't touch it. There's an issue with preservation in the 21st century. We've already altered the land everywhere. So just walking away from it and doing nothing doesn't really work. And even before white European settlers got here, humans were doing something to the land. So just deciding we're not going to do anything isn't really natural or whatever you want to define natural as uh, or normal. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, in mind. So our national parks are run in the vision of John Muir, preservation, and our national forests are run in the vision of Gifford Pinchot, wise use of natural resources. We actually take some timber off of our natural national forests. <clears throat> uh, this, at some point in their lives, led Muir and Gifford Pinchot to split their friendship and decide to no longer be friends. They got in many arguments over should we practice preservation or conservation in this country uh, until others, you know, eventually decided, well, maybe a little bit of both would be would be good. But these two uh, were at first good friends and then eventually uh, became uh, bitter, bitter enemies. I don't know if enemies is the right word, but they didn't. By the end, they did not get along with each other. Pincho for, served as the first chief of the U.S. Forest Service that was established in 1905. He was concerned with the way uh, that the U.S. was using timber and worried that we might run out of timber if our forests were not properly managed. He was noticing all the massive clear cutting taking place, particularly here in the Appalachians. He took a more utilitarian approach to natural resources than Muir did. He was concerned with the greatest good for the greatest number of people in the long run. So something sustainable that goes that that stays to the long run. He founded Yale University School of Forestry in 1900, which was uh, the second school of forestry in North America. He was the president from 1903 to 1936. He maintained a national vision about forestry and he co-founded the Society of American Foresters. Which brings me to Theodore Roosevelt. 1858 to 1919, uh, Theodore Roosevelt is perhaps the most important conservation figure in the history of the United States, maybe even the world. He is definitely the most important president for conservation uh, in the United States. And I want you to look up information about Theodore Roosevelt. So for uh, homework for this week, so by next Wednesday, I want you to take part in a forum discussion that is posted here on Moodle. And I think this is where we're going to end today because we're running out of time. So I think I'm going to finish up this PowerPoint on Wednesday, um, which is not what I had planned, but that'll be okay. We'll catch up. So uh, anyway, back to your homework. On Moodle, you'll see there is a discussion forum. Discussion forum, Theodore Roosevelt. So you need to log on to Moodle. Click on this discussion forum, and there you will see some instructions. So from a natural resources management perspective, Theodore Roosevelt is the most consequential president in U.S. history. Describe two of his notable, notable, uh, notable accomplishments in forestry and wildlife management. 
in detail. Notice that two and in detail are bold and underlined. That means it's important. So describe two of them in detail. That means don't just give me a little, one sentence that says, oh, he established the national park system and that's it. Describe, tell me what all he did. Give me some description in there. A couple, few sentences at least. You're not required to cite any sources for this assignment. Um, oh, I skipped it. Why well, didn't I? So, hit, describe two of his notable accomplishments in forestry and wildlife management in detail, and then discuss how they are relevant to today's natural resources management. So there's a second part of that. to so talk about what he did and how it's relevant today. You can use any resource available to you to come up with your answers as long as the information provided is accurate. That's bold and in underline. So make sure any information you use is accurate. You don't have to recite sources for this assignment, uh, but you do have to write in your own words. So do not copy and paste things into your document. That's plagiarism. Uh, write in complete sentences. Use proper grammar and spelling. Again, bold and underline. That means it's important. Uh, here's a tip. You can type your responses into a word processor. That, like, you know, Word, Microsoft Word. It will spell check for you. It will check your grammar for you. You can make the changes that it suggests. And then you can copy and paste that whole thing into the forum. In fact, that's a good way to write emails. That's a good thing to do. If you're ever typing up something to submit to somebody, type it in Word or some word processor that'll spell check it for you and then and then submit it, copy and paste. Uh, descriptions of each accomplishment should be several sentences each and it should be thorough. Responses are due by midnight on September 21st. That's next Wednesday. And grades for this assignment will be based on how well you meet the criteria listed above. Again, there are two notable accomplishments described in detail, accurate information, complete sentences, proper grammar and spelling, you're written in your own words, turned in by the due date. All of that will affect your grade. Uh, email me if you have any questions about anything about this assignment. I'll be happy to help you uh, try to figure out getting the answers. But uh, do this by midnight next Wednesday. Uh, remember, late work will not be accepted. Make sure you get your quiz for uh, lecture done by midnight uh, this Wednesday. And if you're on the online class, you also have a couple of other quizzes that you need to submit by midnight on Wednesday. So make sure you do that. Anybody got any questions about anything? All right. Well, uh, we're, going to look, we're about five minutes early, but that's all right. We'll end, we'll end there at Teddy Roosevelt, and we'll pick back up with Aldo Leopold next week or on Wednesday. We've talked a little bit about Aldo Leopold, but I'm going to give you some more info. I will see you all on Wednesday.